Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I remember one time, my, uh, Beth and I, my wife, we went to Cross Iron Mills, which is a mall uh, just north of Calgary, where we were from, and we wanted to go to the mall. I think we were doing some like Christmas shopping or something. We were going to do some shopping, and we met there in separate vehicles. Beth came in her car, and I came in my green 1996 Toyota Corolla. Standard. It, was, it had the cassette tape in it. It, it was amazing. 1996. Is my, to be honest, my favorite car I've ever owned in my life. And I love this car, and like to be honest, it wasn't much. It was, it was, you know, an average car, and it was my second car I ever owned, this 1996 Corolla. But anyway, Beth and I do our shopping, and we're about to leave the mall, and again, we have separate vehicles, so we're like, okay, I'll see you when we get back to my mom's house, because we have dinner. I'm like, see you at my mom's house. And so she goes her way, and I go my way. I go out the door, and I walk to where my car was supposed to be, and it wasn't there. The car that I had was dreaming of I love this car and 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 I go in my car where I left it my car wasn't there anymore and I was like someone found the nicest car in the parking lot and stole it I know that they did that I know there's like a Lamborghini over there I know there's a newer car over here but they took my car my beautiful car and I remember like man I don't know even know what to do but I was like you know what let me keep looking. So I kept looking, and I kept looking, and I kept looking, and I could not find my car anywhere I went. Like, I'm telling you, I looked, and I kept walking. And that's a big mall. You ever been to a big parking lot? I'm walking and walking, and I'm like, where is my car? And I, I'm pressing the panic button on my keys. Nothing's happening. I'm like, okay, like, what's going on? And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm searching, and I'm searching, and I'm going, and I'm going. And then all of a sudden, in the distance, I see my car exactly where I parked it are you not joking you 45 minutes me were looking for my car in this parking lot I'm like I, I wish I was joking I get a call about 35 minutes in Beth's been at home she's basically already eaten supper she's like where are you and I'm like do you want me to be honest with you this is a true story and I was she's like yeah where are you I'm like well I couldn't find my car for about 45 minutes in the parking lot of Cross Iron Mills and uh I don't know where it is so finally found it, and I get home, and I'm like, that's one of the more embarrassing moments in my life. Have you ever had that happen? You're looking for something, and you can't find it. Maybe you're looking for your wallet, or you're looking for your keys, or you're looking for your glasses, and then you realize, wow, I can see pretty well right now without my glasses on, and they're right on your face. You ever have a moment where you're searching for something, and you cannot find it? And I looked again for honestly like an hour trying to find my car, and I remember thinking, how could I have been so far off in finding my car? It was not at all where I thought it was. And the reason why is because I went out the wrong exit when I went to find my car. I, I went to the completely wrong side of the mall. I went through the same exit Beth did, and we didn't park in the same location. And the story, this happened years and years ago. I didn't even think we were married yet, when they, or basically like just married when this happened. But have you ever had a moment where you know where you're supposed to go, you know what you're looking for, you know where you want to go in life, you know who you want to be in life, but how often do you understand and realize that we deviate from where we want to go? We, we go in the opposite direction sometimes. We're searching for something, and we know even sometimes what God has called us to. We know what, what the, the dreams or the visions in front of us, yet oftentimes when we're starting to walk in the direction, we keep making choices or the circumstances come, and they kind of deviate our path, and we end up in the complete opposite spot than we thought we would be. We, we were looking for the, the, the call or the dream or whatever God has placed inside of us, and we get there, and we realize we're not even close to where we're supposed to be. We're not even close to where we want to be. The choices we are making aren't leading us towards that future that God has called us to. In fact, I think for some of us, the choices we've made have actually postponed the future or postponed the vision that God has placed inside of us, postponed the call because the way we're living and the choices we're making and the decisions we're taking aren't actually leading us to where we need to go. Sometimes it's our circumstance that comes, and we feel like we've just lost control. We've lost control of our life. We feel like, like, how did I get here? When I know where I'm supposed to be, I know that I should be here, but I look at my life, and I'm nowhere close. 
to where I want to be. And today I want to I want to share uh, the first message. We're going to start a new series today called Samson, and we're going to be going through the story of Samson. And today's message is called uh, the lesson of God's story. That's what I'm going to be speaking about today. That even in the chaos, God still has the crown. That even in trauma, God is still on the throne. That even in pain, God is still present. And through it all, how can we actually get to a point where we actually believe this? That our plans may change, but we can't deviate from God's story in our life. God has still has a plan for you, even if your plans change. Even if the things that you thought would be aren't happening, God still has a plan for you. Even if you're looking at your life and saying, man, I feel like I haven't done anything I want to do. God still has time. If you're still breathing, he's not done with you yet. There's still more inside of you. Because what you're going through, the situation or the circumstance, Jesus is not surprised. It's not like he's like, whoa. He's not surprised by it. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows it all. He wants to be there with you. That even if you're in a dark place, even if the decisions you are making are adjusting your future, God still has a future for you. How often do we deviate from God's story in our life? How often do we try and create something on our own rather than rely on Jesus to lead us through it? And we're going to be sharing a moment in the life of Samson. Now, if you don't really know Samson, you might know, but Samson was really known for two things. He was known by how strong he was, and he was also known by how long his hair was. He had some long locks. And I'm sure they looked amazing. And now when I look at Samson, this is what I think Samson maybe would have looked like. I don't know for sure. But I think he maybe looked like this. And I think of someone that I like, that could kind of be what he looked like. I don't know. I, he was strong and had long hair and probably had a beard and probably was fierce because he was fighting lions. And it was absolutely remarkable what this man did. I feel like maybe he looked like that, but I'm not sure. But if you, we're going to be going through the book of Judges, and in this book, if you don't really know what happens in Judges, I actually have a kind of a cycle of kind of what took place in the book of Judges, and this is really just a, a real chart of what it is, really simple, I have a picture of it here. So what happens is Israel does good, this is so simple, okay, it's like Israel does bad, Israel gets punished, Israel asks God for help, God sends them a judge, Israel is saved, Israel does good, Israel does bad, right? This is the cycle of Judges, if you read it. If you read through uh, the beginning of kind of where this story, we're not going to get to it today, but this story, it says that they were bad, and so, they, so God sent them to, to punishment for 40 years. That's how this like, story begins. But this is what happens in life, very simple explanation of what happened in, in Judges. And one of the Judges that's mentioned in this book is Samson. And again, those of you who don't know Samson well, we can look and see in Judges 13 that Samson takes what's called a Nazarite vow. And Nazarite, all that means is to be set apart. You read through this over and over, see this throughout Scripture. And, and what the Samsonite vow was, this is what they committed to do, those who made this vow to be set apart, was they committed not to drink alcohol, to not touch dead things, and to not cut their hair. That's what he committed to when he was a child. And this was partially through his mom as well. To not drink alcohol, to not touch dead things, and to not cut his hair. This is what they committed to, right? This is Samson. And this is the covenant that Samson committed to and what he was supposed to live up to. And this was God's plan for his life. And those of us who know the story of Samson, he didn't do these things very well. He really struggled with these things in his life. And we're going to be going through a lot of his struggle over this series. And I think for some of us, some of the things that he got, has gone through and he did, I feel like some of us were doing the same thing. But if you read the story, we're going to be in Judges chapter 14. And this is Samson's marriage, 1 verse 9. It says this, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines in Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? 
But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord and that he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. And at that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. And then Samson went down uh, with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, the young lion came toward him, roaring. Now, my first response would have been to run away. But it says, then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. Brutal. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. And after some days, he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there's a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. This is where we see so many things, but he says this. He scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. If we remember the vow he made was to not drink, to not touch dead things. And what's he doing right here? He's torn a lion in pieces, and he sees honey, and he still goes, and he starts carving it out and taking it out of this lion and sharing it with the people. See, I think sometimes when we read the story, we think that he broke his vow the day that he got his hair cut, but in fact, he had been breaking this vow for a while. The things that he had committed to do, the things, the covenant he had made, and I think how many of us is it the same thing? You ever have a moment where you sin and then you're like, God, if you save me this time, I'll never do it again. And we commit to it and then all of a sudden, Sometimes hours later, we're falling into the same trap and we're falling into the same temptation. We're going against the things we committed to with Jesus. They ever have moments like that. This is exactly kind of where Samson finds himself. His journey to losing his strength, which again, we see when he cut, got his hair cut later in the story. It didn't start there. It started by turning his back on the one who actually provided the strength. If you remember, it said the, the, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he defeated the lion. He had turned his back against the one who was actually providing his strength. So I have three points today that I think will help us. And this is a lesson that I'm continuing to learn. And number one is that I'm not the main character of my own story. He's just, Samson, he's on this journey with God. He's on this journey trying to figure it out. But he put himself at the center. He let his own desires, his own kind of flesh get in the way of the calling of the thing that God has called him to rather than put Jesus and put God at the center of his story. He put his ambitions before the ambitions of his father. He put his own stuff in the way. And what happened is that this caused Samson to lose everything. If you know the story, he loses everything because of the decisions that he made. He gets tricked and he loses his hair and He's humiliated publicly, and he can't defend himself. His strength is all gone. His eyes have been gouged out. He can't see. He's become just like a thing of entertainment to come look at this guy, and he's humiliated and beaten. And he's lost everything. When we put ourselves at the center of our story, this can cause us to lose everything because we begin to live our lives so focused on us and so selfish that we are not humble and generous anymore. We go against the things that we've committed to God that we're going to do. And we do this over and over and over again. See, twice in the story we just read, we see Samson, he sees something. And he wanted it, so he took it. It was right in his eyes, so he went and he got it. He took what was not a part of the plan, what was not a part of God's story, that wasn't a part of God's plan for his life, and he took it because he wanted it. We're going to go into this, I think, next week, more about this, but we do this so often because we put ourselves at the center of the story, and what happens is we lose so much. We can lose relationships. We can lose careers. We can lose friendships. We can lose relationships with our children or with our parents. When we start to live our lives so focused on ourselves, we forget that God has called us to so much more. That our lives are supposed to be committed to serving others. How often do we pursue things because they're right in our eyes? 
Even though it wasn't where we're supposed to be going, even though it's not where we're supposed to be looking, we see it and we want it, so we take it. Even if it harms other people, even if it harms our family, we, we want it, so we take it. We want to go through life as if we're the, the main character in our own story. But once we bring Jesus into our life, once we give him our life, he's supposed to become the main character of our story. That he's the one people are supposed to see. He's the one we're supposed to be serving. Not just serving ourselves, but serving him. He becomes the focal point of our lives. He becomes our hero. He becomes our savior. Saving us from ourselves and saving us from sin and saving us from our poor decisions and saving us from all of it. We need to come to the realization that God is actually supposed to be the focal point, the center, the main character of our story. God is the good guy in our story. It's like when you find out the spoiler for a movie before you can watch it. Have you ever had that happen or a book? I knew people. Now, I don't read much, but I knew people that would read the last chapter of a book first because they wanted to know how it ended. And I'm like, that's a, like, you're wasting the point. And I've had spoilers for movies. And I get so frustrated. You're, like, just scrolling on Facebook or on YouTube, and then you're just, like, here, bah, right? It's crazy. But we know the end of the story. We already know how the story finishes. We know that we win and we will overcome, that we're more than conquerors, that we're chosen. That we are his handiwork, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, and the gates of hell will not prevail. We are adopted into his family. We know the end of the story, but we don't live like it. We don't live our life dedicated to our Father. We don't live our life knowing how it ends. We're so anxious and worried and stressed out, and we're so tired. We know the end of the story. Let's give him the role he deserves in our life as number one. Romans 8.31 says this, What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? Who can be against us when God is the main character? If I'm the main character, there's a lot that can be against us. And a lot of it is animals and bugs for me. Bees and spiders. We move to an area... I'm finding out that there's millions of types of spiders. I walk outside. Like, I'm not joking. Pretty much every morning when I get up in the summer, I walk through a spider web as I walk to my garage. True story. That can be against this moment. When God is the main character of our story, nothing can be against me. We need to start living in this promise. The promise that God has already conquered the grave and already conquered sin, already overcome the enemy. We don't live like it, but we have to. He's the one at the center who can stand against when the tax come, when the fire comes, when the water comes. He's standing there with us. He's the one who can stand against. And once we put him at the center of the story, we can realize the next part of this lesson, which I think is a reality, is that I'm a plot twist in God's story. I think a lot of us, when we look at our life, we just look at our lives as we're just a blip on the radar. We see ourselves oftentimes as a failure. A life that the enemy captured and we're unable to attain any more for ourselves. That we believe we're not valuable. When we read through the story of Samson, we look at his life oftentimes in the same way, right? This is a guy who was the judge. Yet at the end of his life, he's left humiliated and broken based on decisions he made. Humiliated, broken, beaten. I think sometimes that's how we feel. And we see Samson, we're like, man, he didn't even do what he was supposed to do. He didn't make it. And when we read through Hebrews, he's mentioned as a hero of the Bible. When we read through, we see, and Samson. Now, I think you read through it, and so you see some heroes. And then some of us were like, Samson, though? Like, the guy that maybe thought of maybe somebody else, Samson? 
He's considered a hero of the Bible. See, he's a plot twist in God's story, not just a blip in the radar, someone that we he read about and, and we can be encouraged by. But somebody who gave it all up, who went against his vow, who gave it all up, still is mentioned as a hero of the Bible. Samson, again, is listed as one of the heroes in Hebrews 11. Verse 32 says this. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon. Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, who quenched the fire, the furry of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. This guy, Samson. Whose weakness was turned to strength. You know, I think some of the, one of the most vulnerable places that we can be as humans is in a place of weakness, of vulnerability. It's, it can be so scary. But it's in oftentimes those moments that actually strength comes. That's when strength can come and our, when we're so weak. That's when we like, we fully are reliant on him. He's listed as a hero of faith. Again, if you read through his story, he made so many mistakes. See, I call this a, a plot twist. I see this as an underdog story whose weakness was turned to strength. Right now, you might feel weak. You might feel like you've lost control. You might feel like you can't go one more day. You might feel like you're a lost cause. You might feel like there's no hope for a better future. I know because I've been there too. You might feel like the choices you're making make you unworthy. You may feel like God can never use you. You might feel like God can never love you. But see, God wants to take your story. He wants to take your pain. He wants to take it and take your weakness and turn it into strength. How do we become a hero of faith? It's that even in our weakest moment, we turn and say, God, I need you. And he will show up for you. You're never too far gone to give Jesus the main spot in your story. You're never too far gone, never too lost, never too far away to turn back and run back into his arms. He's waiting for you. He needs to be the center of our story. We will try over and over and over again as humans to try and create it on our own, try and create something new. But he's the only one who can actually get us to where we're called to be. He's the only one who can actually lead us to the future he's the only one who can actually lead us to the vision he's the only one who can actually give us the strength in our weakest and hardest moment to lead us forward he's the only one to carry you when your strength is vanishing when your faith is low see you're a plot twist that the enemy wasn't expecting you were made him sit up on his couch and gasp you what makes him shake in his boots why because of the power inside of you from Jesus and the Holy Spirit you're more than conquerors. God wants to take your life and turn it into a masterpiece because he loves you. He cares about you. He wants to take the most broken parts of your soul and turn them into his handiwork. God wants you to live out his mission. What's the mission? To go into all the world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That's the mission. And one thing I think is so fascinating, I think I've said this before, but that Jesus chooses to associate with me. That Jesus chooses me. He says, I want you. Even though I'm imperfect, even though I'm broken, even though oftentimes I'm not a great example of his love, he chooses me and he forgives me and he restores me and he saves me. Once we give him our life, he will turn our world upside down because he turns us into a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. He uses who we were to create a new future and create something brand new, a better world and a fuller heaven. He will use us to do that.
Because God cares deeply about every part of you. He wants to fill you with the courage and the wisdom and the strength that you need for whatever you're walking through. Whatever big changes have come, whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever choices you've made, he wants to give you the strength to overcome it. Even though oftentimes we're the, the one who dug the pit, he's the one who throws in the rope to pull us out. He'll give you what you need. He uses you despite his, your flaws for his glory. I don't know if you've ever watched a movie with a narrator. But the next, the last thought I have today, and I think this will maybe help us, is we got to listen to the narrator. I picture it like watching a movie with the narrator, right? We hear the voice of the narrator come on as the main character of the story is about to do something they will probably forget. Regret, I mean, not forget. And this is probably the voice of Morgan Freeman, right? I can't do it well, I'm not going to try. But you know what I'm talking about, where it says Dustin didn't realize in this moment is that he went out the wrong exit and would be looking for his car for the next 45 minutes, right? Hunger began to become a real problem and dehydration was only hours away, right? As he walked and walked in miles in the wrong direction, help seemed like a fantasy, right? What if we had the opportunity to have a conversation with the run writing the story? What if we had the opportunity to have a conversation with the one who has a bird's eye view of what's going on, that we see the mountain and all he sees is the pasture? What if we had access to the mind, to the creator of the universe? What if we had that access? Would we use it? Would you actually ask? Would you actually talk? Would you actually listen to what he is saying? The reality is we have access to that, yet we don't live life like we do. What if we could hear the narrator talking? What if I went out the exit and heard him say, wrong way. I could have found my car a lot faster. I don't know what problem you're going through. I don't know what it's like. I don't know. But listen to what God is saying. He can speak way more life into you and courage into you than you can create on your own. Because oftentimes we try and go through obstacles on our own. Imagine if we could actually talk to the one penning the story, the author. What if we were to listen to his voice as we went through our day? What if we spent unaltered time with him? What if we actually read the scriptures and then just know them but live them out? John 10, verse 3 to 4. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice And he calls his own sheep by name. He knows your name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. Some of us, we don't even know the voice of the one writing the story. We don't know how to differentiate between our own thoughts and God speaking. We have to know his voice. Because he's the one leading. He's the one speaking. We need to follow him. We need to listen and know his voice. The best way to get to know his voice is to get to know his character. And the best way to get to know his character is to spend time reading what he's already said. Some of us were waiting for a revelation. He's like, open up your Bible and dust it off and read that. I already have the answer for you. I already have what you need. Open our Bibles and read and understand how much better would our lives be if we listened to Jesus and God speaking over us. If we understood who we are in his eyes and how he views us and how he created us, how much different would our lives be? John 10.10, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You're right, the enemy's trying to tear us apart. He's trying to destroy everything in your path. He's trying to steal your future. He's trying to kill you. He's trying to destroy it all. That Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to rewrite your story, to lay down his life for you, to give it all for you. 
I think some of us, we spend so much time listening to all the voices around us rather than listening to the voice of our creator. We, we spend so much time listening to what's happening on social media or on the news and we're not actually listening to the one voice that's speaking life to us. Do you know his voice? Whose voice are you listening to? The one that brings life? Or are you listening to the voice that brings death? We have to listen to his voice. He wants to lead you to the abundant life. And the abundant life has nothing to do with status or money. It's all to do with purpose and life. I feel life filled with joy in the midst of trial. Our joy can't be found in anything in this world because eventually it fades away. Every, eventually everything will fade away and all we're left with is face to face with God. Let's find our joy in him. I want to read through the end of Samson's life. This is after he's been, his hair's been cut, he's been humiliated. He's had his eyes taken out. This is Judges 16 verse 27 to 30. Now the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. He'd become basically an animal. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. Oh, God, that I may have be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and he leaned his weight against them. His right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. It's a very unique part of the story. The end, this is the end of the story, right? A life filled with so many decisions and, you know, different circumstances and choices and going against some of the covenants he made. His prayers, oh Lord God, please remember me. Strengthen me. See, Samson called out at the end of his life, at the end of the journey. At the end of it is when he started listening. He, he ended up actually getting to his purpose. He actually ended up getting to his calling. He ended up getting there. He took the long way, though. And at the end of his life, he calls out to him, and God turned what the enemy meant, to ev meant for evil and turned it for good. He took Samson's selfish life and turned it into a miracle. And I believe that this is what God wants to do in our lives even today. It's to bring us back to the path that he laid before us. Some of us when we were children, some of us just recently, he wants us to go back to the path. We've been off the road, we've been trying to eat honey out of lions. He's like, no, it's come back to the road. We need to make sure he's the one that we trust. We need to walk with him, we need to follow his voice. I believe that God is trying to lead us back to where we're supposed to be. That even though we've made a lot of choices, we've done a lot of things that have brought us the wrong place. He wants to take us back to the place we're supposed to be. We're never too far gone. And Samson did it at the end of his life. I'd rather do it now. I'd rather turn back now. Give me more years to actually live out my purpose. That more time to live out the things God has called me to do. Don't wait till the end. Do it now. What you have inside of you is valuable. So valuable that Jesus went to the cross to die for you because he loves you. That we, when we listen to his voice, it has the power to lead us to a better future. To lead us through our situation with strength. To lead us to be there for us in our most painful moments. And we all go through extremely painful moments and hard moments that are exhausting. You know, even this week, you know, Thursday night, 
Jane got food poisoning. And I'm not going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to share all the details of it. You don't need to know. But it was probably, for me as a parent, one of the hardest nights I've ever had. As you see your child sick and can't, can't do anything, and you're like, at least me, I'm like, oh, get me sick instead. You know, like, I'll take, I don't want you to be sick, right? And this is a hard night and a hard, like, weekend because we're just tired, right? Like, you're up all night with a sick child. It's not easy. There's moments of anxiety where you're like, okay, so like, what do we do? Like, is she, like, should we get her, like, should we go to the doctor? Like, what do you do? Like, we have to understand that even in our hardest moments, even in our most painful moments, he loves you. Like, even in your hardest, most painful memory, he loves you. He cares. Like I said, even if you're the one who's causing all the pain in your life, he loves you and he cares about you. Even if where you are is your fault, he loves you and he wants to bring you back. He knows that you're struggling. He knows the fear. He knows the pain. He knows it. My prayer is that this week we can grow closer to Jesus. And my prayer for you is that as you're praying, as you're worshiping, as you're reading the scriptures, that he'll speak to you, speak life into you, that he will bring you peace and he'll bring you joy and he'll bring you courage and that, and as we create space in our story for him, I feel like he's gonna show up and he's gonna do something miraculous in your situation, in your circumstance. Now our takeaway today, today is, is your calling may change your choices. Or sorry, your circumstance may change your choices, but it doesn't cancel your calling. What you're going through doesn't cancel the things God has called you to. If you remember during the pandemic, everything was getting canceled, right? Everything. It's tough. But your calling is never canceled. No matter what. No matter, how, no matter what you do, it's never canceled. It might take you to the end of your life to let it, to pray and to see it happen, but it's never canceled. Have faith that he's gonna lead you through whatever you're going through. You know, before we close our service today, I wanna give an opportunity maybe for those of us in here today, maybe you wanna give Jesus your life today. Give, have an opportunity for you to say, okay, this is my moment to say, okay, I trust you. I'm gonna let you be the main character. I'm tired of it. Because so every movie, the main character always does something horrible and then they have to figure it out. It's like, I'd rather not get to that point. Maybe you want to give Jesus your life today. And how we like to do it is we just like to say a simple prayer that we can pray and say, Jesus, I give you my life. The most simple way for us to just to say, God, I trust you. Say, Jesus, I trust you with my life. You can just even pray that prayer. Whether you're watching online today or whether you're sitting in here today, you can say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you all that I am. I, I trust you. God, I give you my life today. Jesus, I give you my life. You can just whisper that prayer to him wherever you are, whether you're at home again or here. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you all that I am. Now I want to, everyone, close their eyes, bow your heads. I just want to, Maybe you, you, want, you prayed that prayer, you want to pray that prayer. Maybe you're online and you prayed that prayer. I just want you to just look at me so I can pray for you, so I can continue to pray with you and for you. And if you're writing online, if you're watching online, you know, write that, just write that in the chat. Say, Jesus, I, I give you my life. So let's pray together. God, today, collectively, we give you our life. And God, we pray for those online or here today who gave your life, their life today, God, we celebrate and welcome them into your glorious and beautiful and amazing family. We welcome you in. And God, I pray that today, God, help us when it comes to all these things. God, help us realize that I'm not that we're not the main character in our own story. You're supposed to be. 
So God, today we give you that rightful place in our life. We say, God, you're number one. We trust you. And God, we thank you for the miracles we've seen. That when the enemy thought he got us, it wasn't over. It wasn't over. And God, lastly, I thank you. And I say, God, I pray that you help us learn to trust you and listen to your voice. The voice that can help us in times of trouble. The voice that can help us stay out of trouble. God, help us trust you today. And God, I pray for anyone here, anyone listening to my voice who's struggling today. God, I pray that you meet them where they are. Meet them and help them realize that they're never alone, that there's always another in the fire. There's always another in the water. Holding back the seas, but you're always there, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.